All right. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the August 30th, 2021 joint meeting of Planning Commission and Village Council. And um, uh, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. And Judy, if you'd like to call the roll, I'd be very appreciative. All right. Housh. I'm here. McQueen. Here. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Here. Perlis. Here. Doden. Here. Styles. Styles, are you here? Thank you. Amend. Here. Kirk. No, Zaremski. I think Gary's trying to get on right now. I'm going to uh, try to get him a link and get him in. Also present is. Oh, 
uh, Solicitor Brianne Parcels and Planning and Zoning Administrator Denise Swinger. And don't forget Stephen Green. Yeah. Did you call oh, I'm me? Sorry. No. I thought I did. No. Okay. Well, I'm here. <laughs> sorry, I thought I got you. Okay. Right. Uh, excellent. So um, we have a review of the agenda. Um, one thing I'm not sure that I technically need to add, but I'd like to briefly go around and have folks just highlight any goals, expectations, what they want out of this meeting. Um, I've had some different conversations with folks. Um, and so I'll start and then I'll just... <laughs> And, uh, and then, you know, the next person can pass it on to somebody else who hasn't spoken and I'll help keep track. Um, otherwise, is there anything else that we need to adjust with our agenda? Okay. And Brianne, just, uh, I wanted to highlight again that we want to kick off the ethics discussion with, um, a overview of roles and responsibilities with, 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 with. With Planning Commission and Village Council. Okay. Um, so if, uh, if we're ready to go, um, I will just say uh, goals, expectations for me um, is I've, uh, there's been some indication that maybe it would be helpful to have more solid criteria for certain decision making. And so I want to make sure I understand where some of those places might be since council has the policy making role um, in the relationship. And secondly, uh, I have gotten the sense that maybe our communications aren't always as um, rich as they could be. And so I'd like to make sure that we uh, are communicating in a way where we're collaborating, council's not getting in front of planning commission, planning commission understands council policy, et cetera. Um, so I'm gonna pass it to Susan. Well, I, I guess I have to second the things that Brian said, that I think it's good to clarify um, a little bit more planning role and council. And I, I think it's good to go over the um, policies, ethical policies, and make sure that we're all clear on them. And, I, and so I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. And I'll pass it on to Sarah. I uh, again just saying, um, repeating what Brian said, um, absolutely um, some better operationalization um, of the code so we can um, apply it with the right you know conditions and characters that council wants to make sure that's very clear would be amazing. Um, obviously, we all need the ethics training. There, we all have a whole lot of questions, so I'm glad to know we're doing this. Um, also, having a formal process to solidify the communication back and forth between the two entities would be fabulous. So um, we make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, so and I will pass it to Maria. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to have this meeting and to see in particular see people from planning commission and i guess one of the things at the top of my list would just be to hear from people on planning commission how's it going what what's not working what you would like in addition to that i guess i would just reiterate i think uh looking at council's role and planning commission council policy Planning Commission um, figures out how to implement the policy or make the change to the ordinances, whatever, and and how that goes. And if it goes back and forth, if there's a task force, like let, let's say if council says they there's a particular policy that they might area that they at least want to have studied. What might, would something go to a task force? Would it go to Planning Commission? Would both happen? sort of, and how that communication goes back and forth. Thanks. Oh, and I will pass it on to Brianne. 
Well, I think I'd actually like to go um, in terms of my goals for this meeting is to get through my presentation. So um, I'm going to pass it to Frank. Well, in addition to what other people have already said, uh, I'm probably mainly interested in, again, clarifying uh, the uh, different roles for Planning Commission and Village Council, and also then uh, ultimately clarifying the process for uh, yeah, for everybody's sake, for making cha uh, changes that are deemed necessary to the current or the existing uh, zoning rules. So I'll pass it to Laura. I don't, I don't think I have anything to add. I'm, um, I'm not exactly sure what changes we need to any of the rules. I, the rules are like fairly well established and well known, I think. So it's always good to go over them. So I want to save time for Brianne to do that. Um, let's see, Stephen, did you talk yet? No, and I, I really don't have uh, any specific goals for this. I, you know, I think that reviewing the rules and having them clear, especially the ethics rules, is always worthwhile. So I'm 100% behind that. So who who else? If somebody hasn't spoken yet? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. This is Kevin. Okay. Uh, you know, I, would, I just think in general it's good for um, these two bodies to have um, a healthy relationship. So any opportunity for us to get together, um, show appreciation for the work that each body does, understand the relationship and the rules of engagement, I think are important. There's uh, probably nothing major in particular that I'm looking for, but again, I think it's important for us to uh, know what those rules of engagement are, understand um, you know, uh, that, that a planning commission is somewhat uh, an extension of, of council playing a very important role and again, I think it's important for us to have a mutual appreciation for what each of the respective bodies uh, does. And uh, we probably ought to do this uh, on somewhat of a semi-regular basis. Uh, that's all I have, and I'll pass it to Gary. Okay. Um, I don't have anything to add um, beyond what other individuals have already stated. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and okay. this is Matthew Kurtz. Um, I guess I just wanted to uh, say that, you know, echo what everybody else has said, but also I think one thing I've realized in my short time on planning commission is, you know, you, you don't know what the rules should be or maybe how an interpretation should be until you're staring it in the face, right? And you're dealing with the real world application of the code and not that we can't, that we can adjust it on the fly, but maybe coming up with some process so that when we, encounter those things, we have a, a clear pathway to communicate that to council uh, along with some kind of recommendation of changes. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, Lisa Krieger, I think you're wrapping it up. Yeah, sure. So what I would like to add is that as the alternate, I see the um, amount of work that the members of planning uh, do and I want to appreciate that. I hope that every one of my colleagues on council watch these recordings because it's only through that kind of engagement, I think that we can really understand everything that's going on. I think that we're coming into an unprecedented time. I mean, maybe there was precedent some decades ago, but in terms of the decisions that are going to be considered by the planning commission, and by the council. So I think for me, it's just a call for action now more than ever to be really clear about accountability and ethics and decision-making. So that's what I'm you know, bringing, the thoughts that I'm bringing. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Josue, did you wanna add anything else? Uh, I'm excited that we're having this conversation. I, as the administrative uh, officer i have to execute on the vision and mission of both uh, entities so i appreciate uh, you you and frank having coordinating this meeting so that you guys can discuss and um plan plan ahead thanks osway so denise i think you were the last person that we didn't hear from 
And I thought maybe if you have anything to add, and then you can take us into our next topic about ethics. Well, I, I really don't have, I think everything's been pretty much covered for me. Um, I think it's good, though, for us to really define what the different roles are. Um, when you go to the codified ordinances, the planning commission can, um, it was written a long time ago, so the planning commission's roles include um, budgetary things and, and planning out things that right now we have staff for. And maybe at the time that this was written, maybe there wasn't uh, the staff that we have now. So just to be able to clarify some of that and, and um, let's move on to the ethics part. Okay, Brianne, take it away. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. And um, what I'd like to do is just start with an overview of you know, Denise talked about, you know, where do we get our powers? You know, the council, of course, has the uh, legislative and executive power in the village pursuant to the charter, but the planning commission and the zoning board of appeals are also empowered by the charter. So planning commission has five members. They're appointed by council ex and including the member who is a member of council. Not all communities are set up that way. Some planning commission communities have an ex officio member of council as a council liaison. So you've got members appointed for terms of five years, each staggered, and no more than one member may reside outside the village limits. Um, charter was amended in 2007 and, 20, and 2015. And then we've also got the powers and duties that incorporate a lot of the statutory powers and duties of the planning commission, which is basically recommending your zoning. And part of the reason that we're having this meeting tonight building codes. We are going to be back having our own building department. So planning commission may have some role to play with the building codes as well. The other big duty, of course, is platting commission. And when the planning commission looks at its role from a technical standpoint, as Denise said, you know, way back when there wasn't necessarily staff to handle this. And the planning commission was responsible for the platting powers. Now you've got a staff report to generate your actions and um, you know give you a recommendation as to whether something should or should not be approved when it comes to plats within the village. Um, as far as the budget appropriation, again, the budget appropriation now is more of the uh, you know, zoning and development department than it is specifically to the planning commission itself. Here's where we get into the well, is it planning commission or is it council? All of your planning commission recommendations under the charter, section 65, have to be considered by council in the regular procedure for ordinances. So if planning commission says, you know, we're thinking of a change to the zoning code, it goes to planning commission, then it goes to council. But council as the legislative authority also has the ability to say, hey, planning commission, we would like you to do this when it comes to changes to the zoning code, um, other policy types of um, codified ordinances that may not necessarily be the zoning code, but might be related. So any modification you know, that planning commission submits to council for recommendation, council can actually overrule a planning commission recommendation. And then section 66, which we won't deal with tonight, is the BZA. Now getting into the ethics part of things, I'm going to do a new share here. And we're gonna talk about my PowerPoint, which you all, all have access to, but we'll start it from the beginning. Because the planning commission by our charter is set up to consider conditional use and BZA is set up to consider variances, planning commission acts in both a legislative and a quasi-judicial capacity when it's making decisions. And the thing that you have to understand from an ethical standpoint is, if you're acting in a legislative capacity, the bar is a little bit lower than when you're acting as a quasi-judicial capacity. But under Ohio ethics law, your big thing is not acting on your conflicts of interest. So let's get into that. What is quasi-judicial? Well, it means acting like a judge. So decisions that have direct effects on the rights of any individual person or property owner are quasi-judicial. Um, yeah, you're applying existing law. What's the codified ordinance say rather than making new law? You're requiring a finding of fact. So when planning commission acts and takes a vote, if a planning commission member explains why they are voting the way they are, 
that should be documented in the minutes because those findings of fact are what you're acting on as a planning commission based on any evidence presented at a public hearing that either the standards of the codified ordinances have been met or that they haven't. So when you're asking about legislative topics, you know, well, this is the larger changes to the zoning code that are not affecting specific property owners. So what's the test? Well, you know, you're adopting a general rule of policy. It's, a, it's effective for everybody, a wide class of in, individuals. So if you're saying, you know what, we're going to make all these changes to the zoning code as a whole, not specific to certain properties. That's a legislative function of the Planning Commission. And again, that recommendation would then go to council, which has the ultimate legislative authority. So if you're applying law that already exists, you're judging, <laughs> you're acting like a judge. And if you're applying a general rule of policy to specific individuals, and this is where it gets sticky, applying law that already exists, that's applying the exact language of our codified ordinances or relevant statutes. Now, if you're saying, well, we're gonna apply a general rule of policy based on something that's not in the code, but just like general community sentiment, you're still acting in a quasi-judicial capacity. Where you run afoul of Ohio law is if it's not in the code, you technically shouldn't be able to consider it. So it does make a big difference. When you're looking at ethics and due process considerations, you've got legislative trial type procedures for hearings that aren't required for legislation, but they are required when you're making a quasi-judicial decision. So again, this is things like conditional use hearings. Now you can have a public hearing on an ordinance to change the zoning code at large, but there's no trial type procedure. You're not cross-examining witnesses and allowing, I mean, you're, you're, you're allowing the public to speak, but you're not, um, you're not affecting a specific property owner's interest by passage of a generalized code. So again, your examples of your quasi-judicial rules, variances are always quasi-judicial. Um, you know, and appeals from planning commission decisions, BZA is always quasi-judicial body, but planning commission, Conditional uses, subdivision, platting, development requests, rezoning requests, anything that's unique to a specific property, it's probably going to be quasi-judicial. Now, we also have, again, the legislative aspect and re reviewing and recommending your, your overall changes to the zoning code. So what's the fairness standard? Well, again, you're going to try to act like a judge. You're not just going to avoid your own conflicts of interest, but you're going to follow the Ohio Code of Judicial Conduct when you're acting like a judge, which is upholding and promoting independence, integrity, and impartiality, and avoiding not just impropriety, but the appearance of impropriety. So that's available on the Supreme Court's website. And again, when you're sitting in that role, you gotta be fair and impartial, not just in actuality, but in appearance of your official duties. So your actual conflicts of interest or undue influence, not necessary if someone says it, it appears that you look like you've engaged in self-dealing or influenced by something outside of what's in the public record, you've got a problem with public perception equaling public trust and you probably shouldn't be voting. Now the Ohio ethics law says if you've got a conflict of interest, you must disclose it and you must recuse completely from all your discussion. So what are the due process rights? You have applicants notice and an opportunity to be heard. So that's informing the public as to the nature of any proceeding and giving people time to prepare and present objections. Again, generally speaking, we get these things in the newspaper and the procedures have to be consistent. Now, again, from Judy's perspective, she, she will always ask who voted, who said what, because the thing that we need to uphold in court from the village's end is having a reviewable record at all times. And whoever applies, whether it's planning commission, BZA, council, anyone who applies, whether it's for a uh, plat or anything else, the people who apply have a right to a neutral and impartial decision maker. So again, I'm going to you know, harp on the no undue influences. It's not that you can't have a conflict of interest. It's that you cannot vote if you have a conflict of interest. And it's not just voting. You have to recuse completely from discussion under the Ohio Ethics Law 102.03. So what happens when um, 
you know, you do have a conflict, well, disclose it. You know, if you say, hey, so-and-so came up to me at the coffee shop, I didn't know it was going to be on the agenda, disclose it, don't participate any further. Disclose circumstances that affect your impartiality, because if it prevents you from hearing the case and you would have been a deciding vote either for or against, then we could have a problem, especially if we can't get a quorum. So it's a forward-looking and a backward-looking rule. Again, every applicant has the right to a fair and impartial process. You can't act on not just, you know, your documented conflicts of interest, but if you have a strongly held inalterable belief that is contrary to the law that you're going to be applying, then you might have a conflict of interest, even if it's not material or financial. You have to base your decision on codified ordinances, which is the law and the evidence that is presented at any sort of hearing, which means you can't have ex parte communications outside the record. You, know, you can't you know, have coffee with an applicant and talk about your application before the public hearing. You, it, it's, it's unfair, it's one-sided. It's like you know, a defense counsel calling the judge at home and saying, hey, can I uh, you know, get this person sprung from jail because they're a good guy without the prosecutor getting a chance to weigh in on whether or not yeah, the victim has a say in things. So don't engage in ex parte contact. So it can, it can take a variety of forms. You know, you, you see something, you hear something, you actually participate in a conversation, uh, texting, emails. Again, you have to ensure the right to a fair hearing and a fair process because it's unfair to take information from only one side or to present evidence in private when we have a public hearing process for a reason. Everyone's got the right to be heard. Again, the reasonable notice opportunity to prepare, we try to schedule these things in advance as far as, po as, far as possible so people know what's gonna be on the agenda. And when do you need to be concerned? Well, of course, when an application has been filed, but say you kind of think something's coming because Denise has said, during agenda planning, hey, this might be on the agenda, but it hasn't been yet. So in pending matters, you talk to someone on Monday, they file an application on Tuesday. Well, guess what? You might have a problem. And then of course, you've got issues with appeals. If a court, or in this case, counsel, remands the decision to the planning commission and says, um, you know, we, we want you to reconsider something, but you thought it was done. So you've already spoken to one of the parties, again, off the record, outside of a public hearing, then you've got problems. So avoid your contacts. And if you accidentally do have an ex parte contact, disclose it at the beginning of the meeting. You can contact me anytime. It doesn't have to be at the beginning of the meeting that you disclose it to me. Because if you want some advice on what happened, I will tell you discuss what happened related to you and the situation you were in and whether it's impacted your opinion or your view of the matter, whether you can still be unbiased. Give notice and allow response if necessary and permissible. So what if you, know, you get a phone call, an email, you run into someone on the street, you're at a meeting, the matter comes up, you conduct a site visit and the neighbor's there or you read something in the newspaper, disclose it. I mean, those are all things that as... People sitting in quasi-judicial roles, you have to be careful about, again, public perception of fairness. So disclose. What do you need to disclose? Well, at minimum, who made the contact with you and what the substance of the contact was. Um, if it was written, you know, give it to Judy. Make it part of the record. I mean, you know, if it's if it's incorporated in the record, a lot of times we we can work around it because. You know, if, you know, say someone sent something to her intending that it's part of the record and then copies every other member of the planning commission, well, that's actually kind of typical. That's not necessarily an ex parte contact. You might have read it before the meeting, but it was also in the agenda. You know, getting it a couple of days before the agenda was put together, I can't say that's going to be some unfair, unbiased thing. So again, you know, do your best to avoid the inadvertent Contacts, you know, be familiar with your upcoming agendas. And as soon as the, you get that feeling that, oh, you know, this is this is going down a road that I don't need, 
tell the person, please stop. Um, you know, you need to come to the planning commission meeting. You need to come to the council meeting and discuss it there on the record. And don't put your personal mailing addresses on websites. I mean, you know, as council members, you know, you're all elected officials. So your information's on the board of elections website, but I mean, you'll get anonymous mail. It happens. And again, the biggest thing from the legal perspective, not just the ethical, is in terms of defending any decisions by planning commission, by council, we need to have a reviewable record. So those findings of fact have to be based on what happened during the hearings. So that's all I've got from the ethics uh, perspective. I know several of you attended the training that we had on August 20th, and I really appreciate you doing that. And if you have any more questions for me from the ethics end, I'll stop there and uh, we can move into the next topic. All right, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to mic on and ask them or comments. Yes, I have a question. Um, and this is something that's come up in the past. So I'm, I'm speaking as a council member, let's say, well, it, this actually happened. So, oh, so I I used to have a transit and guest lodging, and uh, council was going to make a decision on that. So I recused myself, mm -hmm. but I went and I sat in the audience at the council meeting. Is that enough, or should the should I have left the room? That is enough, as long as you are not participating in the discussion now. I know council has access to it. I don't know if it was shared with members of the planning commission, but we actually have a former planning commission member who had an OEC investigation that went and sat in the audience, but then he represented his client during the planning commission meeting. And that is, that is, I don't want to say a cardinal sin, but that is a blatant violation of, of ethics law. You can't represent others before the body that you sit on. Sitting in the audience quietly and not representing other parties, yes. I mean, as long as you are not at council table participating in the discussion, I'm not going to say, yes, you should just leave the room. I mean, but sometimes for people that's easier because then there's absolutely no question. On a Zoom call, I mean, you know, well, what are you going to do? Drop out and then how are we going to let you know that you come back in? I just say muting yourself on a Zoom call as long as you're not participating in the discussion, you're fine. Anything? Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, and this is a somewhat fluid conversation. So if questions come up, um, feel free to ask them. Uh, so the next topic is around um, how changes to zoning happen, legal, ethical, effective aspects. And um, Denise, are you kicking this one off or? I, I mean, I can just generally. I'm, okay. I mean, it's, it is in the zoning code that, you know, anyone, an individual, um, a, a body, uh, the council, can, anyone can bring a potential text amendment to, and it goes through a two-step process. They can bring it to planning commission. Planning commission can vet it, and, and it is a public hearing. Um, and then um, planning commission makes a recommendation, either the recommend and the and the recommendation goes to council. They can either recommend that this um, that this amendment happens, or they can recommend that it doesn't. And then council then it goes to council, and they can make that decision. So that's, I mean, anybody can can request a text amendment, um, but typically that's not, they don't usually come from the general public. We've had one in, in, in recent memory, uh, and that was a rezoning um, to from uh, B1 district to RC on uh, Xenia Avenue. But typically they'll come from staff if, the, if it's uh, something in the code that, isn't meshing with uh, conflicting with something else in the code, then staff will make a recommendation to for corrections to it. Um, we've ha had uh, a planning, a former planning commission member that had 
um, suggested um, to staff the, the, the concept of the pocket neighborhood development. So then staff did the research on it and then brought it to the planning commission as a possible amendment to the code. And then council considered it as well and, and accepted it. <clears throat> but typically if it comes from staff, it isn't, it isn't anything that isn't that it usually, what I try to do is, is make sure that if I'm, if I'm requesting a text amendment, that it's something that will, will meet the goals that the council's already set. So for example, the infill, um, th there were some opportunities that I discovered within the code that could allow for more infill development. And then I brought that before planning commission who then made a recommendation to council. So and that's typically how that happens. Um, sometimes council, usually it's only related to the zoning code, but council does sometimes make a request to planning commission to um, help with other sections of the, of the codified ordinances, for example, the weeds. That's not in the uh, zoning code, that's in the general fences code, but um, we were asked to participate in that and planning commission did a lot of work on that after the environmental commission did a lot of work on it. So that's kind of a general overview of, of, of text amendments. And I, I can share the screen to actually show that section of the code for 1280. Give me a second here. So uh, as Denise said, you know, council can propose, planning commission can propose, any citizen can propose. But to Mary Ann's point about, you know, how do we how do we get certain amendments like, um, you know, to be studied or have some sort of task force? The weeds is a prime example because it wasn't just staff and planning commission working on it. We had skilled individuals from the environmental commission who were making recommendations as well. So when we talk about task force, we've got a number of boards and commissions that don't necessarily have the planning commission's power because they're more advisory in nature, but they are set up to be advisory to council. And there could be some overlap when you're talking about some of the goals of a zoning code when it comes to you know, planning and um, you know, some of the goals that council has set. So when you're talking about a text amendment, generally speaking, as Denise said, we, you know, we've had this zoning code since 2013. There are certain areas where, um, as Planning Commission has proposed several times since I came on board, clarifying the intent of the code is a big one. Because if you've got things that aren't defined, how can you apply them? Correcting errors in the code, um, addressing changes based recent case law, state uh, legislation. You know, those are the kinds of things that we definitely want to stay on top of because you know, we're, we're looking at what Josue and Denise and I have been calling low hanging fruit. You know, how can we make our zoning code more user friendly? Um, and recent case law has come out in terms of minimum lot sizes that, you know, that case law came out in 2019. We should probably be looking at some way to apply it, promoting compliance with other, you know, county, state, and federal regulations and implementing the comprehensive plan, which was just done in September last year. So, um, you know, the other big thing is not creating incompatible land uses because again, the planning commission is responsible for conditional use considerations. You know, we've got a lot of general requirements for your conditional use permits. And then we've got specific requirements based on the type of conditional use you know, one of the things that we might look at is harmonizing some of those. So that's my spiel. All right, thank you, Brianne. Thank you, Denise. Um, Josue, anything that you want to add to this topic? Um, there... To add to what Denise and, uh, and Brianne were saying about staff having uh, recommendations to make or proposing changes, you know, we, we look at what is the conflict and how we go about our jobs and, and uh, what are the, the conflict in the law and what we want to apply and what citizens want. And there are things that we brought up, right? We brought up the annexation and we're thinking about additional annexation. I'm talking about the 
uh, annexations of publicly owned property. Uh, we're looking at that because we find that those are important uh, aspects or uh, assets to protect in the village. So now that um, I, th I think we're going to get into more of that work in the near future uh, with the experience we had last year about the Sun Farm and building out pole barns, We've, we put it in the comp plan that we wanted to annex our well fields and other village owned assets. And so we're certainly going to be bringing those actions in the near future or, or recommendations. And so it's good that we're having this conversation because you'll see a lot of the work in action in the coming months as we look to execute what Brianne pointed out is our comprehensive land use plan. All right, thanks, Josue. Um, any questions or comments based on what we, yeah, Marianne? Yeah, I, I wanna uh, throw out an example to see how people think it would go. And I'm pretty much making up the example because I don't wanna use a, a real thing. But I'm, I'm going to say I, as a council member, and this part is true, I'm always looking at what's coming down the pike in terms of a relocalization, for example, local economy, things like that. So let's say that I, I'm reading articles uh, about communities across the country that are starting to change their zoning codes to allow groups of neighbors to sort of combine their homes to do joint projects like, uh, and this actually is happening, combine all their backyards and their gardening and, and they have different gardens in all the backyards. Let's say, and I don't know that this is happening, neighbor, two neighbors say they want to um, do a business together and they wanna have a home business. And these kind of things, let's say, are being promoted in terms of relocalization and some of the more progressive uh, communities in the United States are changing their zoning codes to allow home businesses to allow much more flexibility in terms of home businesses. So it's a sort of big topic. So I come to council and I say, I think we should consider this. Now, in my mind, I'd sort of think like, this is a big topic. So we probably would want to have if, if council agreed a task force to look at it, or I don't know, would Denise, look? it doesn't seem like we would just throw that at planning commission. It seems like we'd have some group look at sort of best practices, what works and what doesn't, and then something else would happen. So I, I'd like, I guess, staff or Brian and people to weigh in on how something like that can, can move through the lodge back and forth and like that. Denise, do you want to tackle that one? Um, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, she, I mean, she's right. I mean, if you get if somebody wants both of those examples, wouldn't wouldn't fly with the zoning code right now. I mean, so to me, I feel it really then becomes a council. Uh, I think a council would be the first step. I mean, I could be correct me if I'm wrong, Brianne, but I would think that with something that that big of a topic where you're talking about um, changing the zoning code, that really could have a, a big effect on land use throughout the village, um, I would think that that would have to start with council, but that's just my personal opinion. Yeah. And the other thing to consider is, um, you know, when you look at 1276-02, um, the planning commission and village staff are obligated to do continuous review of, and this is in the code, effectiveness and appropriateness of the code and recommend appropriate changes or amendments. So the type of thing Marianne's talking about you know, we don't really have a mechanism in the code to set up a task force, but assigning it to staff for investigation, that, that falls squarely within 1276.02 in terms of, well, this is something that we know is coming. We want to get ahead of the curve. Um, yeah, we need to be ready for it. Well, that's the problem with most zoning codes is, you know, we, 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 if zoning codes are not a set and forget. They have to be continually adjusted to change with the times. I mean, your comp plan may be every 10 years, but your zoning code is something that you have to tackle piecemeal as these issues come up. So when village council gets a recommendation from planning commission, you know, according to the procedure in 1280.03, you know, council looks at, you know, rezonings and amendments to the code um, 
you know, basically on a case by case basis, you know, council has the ultimate legislative authority in terms of saying this, this is the policy that we want to implement and you know, planning commission can make the recommendations in accordance with council's goals and policy. All right, any other comments, questions? Um, I just wanna make one more comment perhaps. Um, you know, there's been letters that have been written uh, talking about the fact that our zoning code is, um, it's, uh, I'm trying to think what the term was. It's not uh, exclusionary. Yeah, inclusionary. That's Thank the you. term that's being used now. Thank you. Um, and um, and I don't know if everyone is aware, I know everyone here should be aware of it, the general public, that this zoning code isn't, it was only adopted eight years ago. Um, and it, prior to that, it had been, uh, I think in the 80s, maybe, before it had been uh, worked on. And, you know, there was a technical review committee of citizens that were appointed. Um, and then there were members of planning commission that vetted it. Um, and then it went on to council who made additional changes. There, th there was some, a little bit of um, pushback um, on that code. And the, and the goal was to try to make it more um, inclus inclusionary uh, to allow for like the accessory dwelling units and, and infill development. Uh, so, um, what happened, unfortunately, and I think Laura was around during that time is, um, the consultant would, would be given these changes at the council level. And I think sometimes things were only changed within like the, uh, the schedule of district uses and perhaps not in the individual cha district chapters. And so there's a lot of things in the code with the zoning code today that conflicts with each other. And, and that's partly because changes were made at these different levels. And probably by the point, by the time it got to council, I think the consultant was pretty much over it. Um, <clears throat> so, <laughs> we know staff has really tried to work with this and make it better. And I, and like Brianne had pointed out, um, the Ohio Supreme Court was that Ohio Supreme Court, Brianne, or maybe federal on the it was Ohio Supreme Court, Ohio Supreme Court, and and staff is aware of it. It was just getting a chance, and we've had so much on our plate as as planning commission in the past few months that we haven't had a chance to actually bring it to you, um, which would. Uh, which is a conversation about uh, making the minimums 4,800 square feet uh, for all lots and kind of removing that barrier. Um, the only, the other one that staff sees me in particular is uh, more of a mix of developments again. Um, right now, <clears throat> if you're in residential A, you could do a pocket neighborhood development, but that has specific parameters. And then, you could do the only way you could do something which would be more inclusionary in zoning would be the uh, making it a PUD, which we don't always want to use a PUD. So things like having duplexes or multifamily dwellings, perhaps an RA, could be another thing that we could change. But I think the code is fairly solid in, in that it does try hard to, uh, it's probably one of the more liberal codes around. Um, and I think that we express that all the time, even, even with our variance process. Um, was at a meeting the other day with other uh, zoning administrators. I think ours is, is pretty unique. And um, when I, I talked with a contractor the other day, I was telling him, well, you know, you'll have to go to for a BZA hearing more than likely on this. Uh, he was like, I, he was like, well, is that even something we could do? I mean, absolutely. I think that the BZI can never make a hundred percent guarantee that they're going to pass something, that it should be good um, based on what, what the request is. And his response was, well, if you were city of Kettering, I wouldn't even put in an application of just never, they never grant variances. So I think that we're pretty open, not just staff, but 
Planning Commission and BZA to really um, work with people. And by the time it gets to that point, like a BZA, it's been vetted through Planning Commission so that it, it's not, it shouldn't be as much of a struggle for the BZA to make a variance decision. So that's all I want to say. All right, thanks, Denise. Uh, any other questions or comments? Well, I, I did want to you know, make two more remarks, Brian. Um, we put up the uh, roles and responsibilities document that was drafted back in 2019. And planning commission by ordinance is supposed to set its own rules um, and file them with the clerk of council. So if we wanted to amend some rules, you know, that, you know, that's that document is kind of our rules as it stands now since 2019. But if we wanted to amend some rules to improve the flow of information between planning commission and council, that document would be our starting point. That's what was put into the agenda. But the other thing to remember about our zoning code, and I, I you know, I don't want to get up too far off in the weeds. It's not just about council's goals when it comes to the zoning code. The zoning issue is about implementing, you know, the goals in our comprehensive plan, but you also have zoning to protect your infrastructure. You know, you're, you're trying to protect your water, your sewer, your capacity for development um, in order to promote orderly growth and be able to serve what you have, not just what you want to have. So you're looking at eliminating hazards when you're talking about, you know, minimum lot sizes or construction, um, you know, being a certain distance from a property line, you know, when we talk about like zero lot line setbacks from a property line or from a neighboring structure, you know, hazards such as, you know, traffic congestion, fire, flooding, that sort of thing, um, which are public safety concerns. So it's not just about, um, you know, location and, you um, you know, business and economic development, it's those practical infrastructure concerns as well. Okay. Um, all right, so I think we should <clears throat> transition into, oh yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Um, I just had a question, you know, we're talking about formalizing this. So there's been, um, you know, I, at least the economic impact for that last conditional that I know I asked that to be, Sent up to be clarified. Is that still noted somewhere? I don't have the code right in front of me. I just find it. But... I believe I know which one you're referring to, but um, Sarah, I can email you about at, at, about that after the meeting when the where we were talking about the conditional use considerations. Well, that because um, it wasn't defined, and so I asked that it go back up to council so we get. I think it was social or and economic, and I feel like there was one other one in there that um, seem to be more with, aligned with the community um, goals and sustainability type feel. And so it felt more like it should be something that was directed from council than, than using just a Webster's dictionary definition. Um, so I had that, I believe that's what you're talking about. I just wanna make sure it doesn't get lost in the mix. Or is this what you're talking about in the standards? For so it was um, brought up in the last meeting, I believe we were in person, um, and it was on... 1262.04. Maybe. Yep. Protect national resources, health, safety, and welfare, and the social and economic well-being of those who will use land who will use the land use or activity under consideration. Residents, business owners, and land or owners immediately adjacent to the proposed use or activity and the community as a whole. Which that seems like a you know a very big important um, protective um, statement for our community, um, and so some more guidance about how we should be applying that would be very helpful. So, Brianne, yes. I have a question. So, if if a person brings a conditional use and they meet all of the zoning code's requirements, but then there's still that standard. What, I mean, I think that's sometimes what planning commission struggles with too. I mean, they may meet all the 
building requirements for like say for example an accessory dwelling unit lot coverage setbacks height all that stuff um it's got access to utilities it's it's not going to block any views but then it comes down to that that yeah. standard that you have yeah um, well and again i di i didn't write this <laughs> be blunt but yeah. 126204 as sarah said you know it it would be helpful to get some guidance what does that mean because it's not defined elsewhere in the code social and economic well-being and again, the problem with implementing something that's in the code, but you don't actually have a binary standard, yes or no, um, you know, un unlike with the BZA, considering it's Duncan factors, which is always yes or no, um, you know, this is something that, you know, planning commission members have to discuss and make findings of fact, but the, the language of the ordinance itself can be kind of fuzzy and hard to apply. So if we were to look at changes to what are our conditions of approval for conditional uses, is that something that we'd want to bake in a definition for that can actually have some objective criteria on it? No. No, it's like just out of the time I've had in Yellow Springs, I mean, I, I was impressed that, was, that this was in the code. It's definitely a... Um, is more modern approach to how the zoning is, but it absolutely fits the community dynamic. So I think it's a wonderful thing to have in there and some further guidance would be fantastic. Yep, thank you for raising that. And, you know, this is exactly, you know, I don't expect that we'll, you know, uh, nail down all the issues where more guidance, uh, you know, is uh, in order. But I think this is definitely the kind of flow of communication that we want to figure out and maybe you'll brainstorm a little bit about at the end. Um, so I know we were going to talk a little bit about the PUD process and then um, leave plenty of time for any other ideas or concerns around things. Um, Brianne, were you going to be? I'm going to leave most of it to Frank and Denise, and here's why. <laughs> and to an extent, Judy. I've done plan unit developments in plenty of other communities, but just so you all know, you know my big ex parte, please don't go there. Um, you will have some PUDs coming up in the near future. And, and Denise has talked about some of them in agenda planning. Those ways talked about some of them individually with you. So you know you've got some PUD projects coming up, but what the process is for a PUD under our code and what the, okay, here's the steps in the process. Denise actually has set up a timeline. Again, that's all you know in the agenda and packet materials, but Frank actually had a very detailed breakdown of the steps in the process. So I'll let them take it away. Uh, I'll just give a very general and then kind of let Frank take it from there <clears throat> because he did set that up for um, the Millworks property to uh, ensure that we were following all of the standards that and, and asking those questions when when each um, each section of the plan unit development for density in for like say example density they have to meet certain requirements and to, and to see if they had but essentially the PUD is, is really just another develop developers tool um, then to do something different, creative with the land use that the RA, RB, or RC, or whatever area that they're wanting to build or you know have their business or development in uh, can have that flexibility. And typically their PUDs are supposed to be five acres or more, but we've had more recent ones that have been less than five acres. So the first step is is the applicant has to go to council and ask if they can even do it uh, with less than five acres. Once that process has happened, then you know staff will work with, um, we'll have like a pre a pre meeting with them just to talk about you know infrastructure, utilities, that kind of thing, and then we go into the preliminary process, which they submit the application then they can have they can request a meeting with the planning commission the planning commission obviously wants to have a work session with them first to go over what the plant prop the plan is the development is and 
can ask for specific information uh, in, in that, because oftentimes, you know, conditional use hearings, plan unit developments, these are all, these often happen within one meeting. It's rare that you have to table something and take it to a second meeting, although, although you can. But <clears throat> this work session enables the planning commission to ask for more detailed information before we, they go into the public hearing process. And then there's obviously the, the meeting for the, the public hearing. Um, this is where Frank will get into what he does, but what, at the conclusion of all that, it then has to go on to council. So we're talking about a minimum of three to four months just to get through the PUD process. And, um, and that's probably hurry, hurrying it along. Uh, so then it goes to council for the final approval. Now with <clears throat> PUDs, there's a preliminary process approval that go, it goes to planning commission. Planning commission makes the recommendation to council. Then council has to vote on whether they accept it. That's the end of council's involvement with it. When they come back with the final plan, if it has not varied, and there are standards within the planned unit development to determine whether it has major changes or not. If there are not any major changes, then it, the final uh, plan is only goes to the planning commission. And the planning commission, and this is not where the planning commission can overturn what council has already approved. So it's not something where if council's approved, like for example, a density, it's not, and that density hasn't changed, that's not something planning commission can then say, well, we're not gonna uh, allow this because of the density. Um, because that's all, something already council had changed. So this is really a look back at if there's been no big changes, then they're, they're giving their final stamp of approval on it. If there are major changes to it, then it has to go way back to the preliminary again, which means it goes to planning commission, goes back to council, and then back again to planning commission, if that makes sense. Frank, you want to add anything on that? Yeah, all I'll really want to add is, uh, you know, and I think uh, probably uh, emphasizing on uh, the PUD requirements timetable that uh, Denise was just talking about, uh, that number four, that meeting with the preliminary meeting with the uh, with the planning commission. I think those are, are very important and as an opportunity to work things out, know exactly where we're uh, where we're heading, and. Perhaps what we can plan to do, and because uh, I'm now I'm also looking at that the uh, the, the cheat sheet that uh, sort of the script that I wrote up for voting on uh, uh, PUDs that at that uh, you know, uh, uh, planning session that might be a good time uh, to review the cheat sheet. Uh, together uh, as a planning commission so that we know where we're heading when we're getting to the meeting. I think uh, part of my impetus for writing up this script for voting on PUDs stem from like the first one that I was a part of, which I think was, uh, was that the No Works, Denise, if I remember right? I just remember it took uh, forever. No, yeah, there was one that took a long time. I remember now. Yeah. I thought that was and, one where you had that. And, and part, of, uh, part of what made it confusing, I think, for people is uh, the way the, uh, the, uh, the code is written out in uh, just the, the, I'm sorry if I'm stammering. I, you can see the side of my head. I had a fall last night and I said, yeah. I'm a little wobbly, but I'll, I'm, I'm sure I will recover. Uh, but I remember when we just tried to work straight through the code, when we got later, it seemed like we were saying, well, haven't we already voted on this? And you, you basically, it just seemed like there was an awful lot of redundancies built into the way the code was written up. So at one point uh, after that, I took uh, sat down for a weekend with the code and based on what's in the code, wrote up the script that uh, uh, that Judy has sent around to everybody for a process to go through just to make the uh, 
planning commission meeting when we're actually voting on the on the PUDs make it make more sense not only to the members of planning commission but I think also to the members of public and to the applicants who are there as well because I think a lot of people were confused one of the first times that we went through one of these and I think this will clarify this clarify the process so what I would ask planning commission members to do is just open up the uh, uh, grab your three ring binder of the code sit down with the script that I have look through it see if it uh, see if it makes sense. I, I think it does. I think everything works. I think there are ultimately a couple of uh, unusual things that we, you know, what we can get to at the end of it uh, with the options that we have to either vote to, what was it say, approve, disapprove, or approve with modifications. And, you know, you can get weird situations like, okay, if somebody makes a motion to disapprove and we vote against the motion to disapprove, what does that mean? <laughs> you know? uh, and but those are just things that I think we'll have to take some time to to talk through and figure out. Okay, what are our what are our strategies? What we're we going to do in case something like that crops up? But take a look at the script. Uh, jot down any questions or concerns you have about it, and I think the time to talk about it will be when we uh, have one of those uh, uh, meetings that. Uh, uh, Denise has listed as number four for a PUD, just so we can review everything beforehand so that we know where we're going. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Brianna, if that was right before a meeting, would I still be able to participate in the discussion? Yeah, as, as long as it is focused on the general PUD process. Okay. 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 Um, and one of the things that I wanted to weigh in on, on that, Frank, was you know, Planning Commission, again, can set its rules. And one of the ways that you can uh, uh, adjust the, you know, what does a mo what does a vote to not disapprove mean? You can actually say our planning commission procedure is going to be to always call for a vote in the affirmative, rather than vote to dis vote to disapprove. Yeah. It will always be vote to approve on a PUD. Right. If you set that up by your internal rules for the planning commission. Right. Okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is, you know, and again, this is this is a council on a policy decision. Um, Frank nailed, you know, the the logistical problem in terms of your review standards under twelve fifty four oh six. You've got all of these, and it says the proposed development meets all of the following general standards, and any any no is going to kind of kick out the project. So what do you do? Do you modify it? Well, again, that's one of those, well, we, we could change our code, but what policy directive does council want to consider? You know, given that this code dates from 2013, are, is there better language to use? You know, do we want to say on balance of the factors, given that there are so many factors? You know, does it have to be all or does it have to be 75%? I mean, that that is something that, the you know, planning commission can study and make a recommendation to council or council can take the initiative and say, you know what, how many projects have we had for PUDs where that's just not practical? Again, that's something that, you know, when you look at staff and your members of the planning commission, they are there to serve as a technical advisory group and making recommendations to council. So you might want to look at, well, we've been doing this now since 2013 how what's worked what has it yeah. um because this is what happens, you know all the time with these pud's you know they go through we'd have a plan the developer would come back and want to do changes like in zini we had issue with too small square foot so we did a minimum square foot um saying that the houses have to at least be i think it was 1400 square feet so in the mix of all that, they would come back and say, well, no, we only want to do 1,200 square feet, so can you guys revise the PUD? Um, how would that be dealt with in Yellow Springs at this point? Well, the, the PUD follows the, the zoning district that the plan is geared towards. So, for example, um, with, I think the one that we all struggled through was the was the PUD, the first PUD, Frank, was the uh, Home Inc. Uh, PUD between Marshall and Herman. Um, in that one, 
you the the code that we followed was residential C. Um, so in that case, because it was slightly, I can't I'll remember if it was slightly over an acre, they could have up to 32 units, but they were coming with 56. Um, and so it, it became the struggle for planning commission to say, well, what, how much density is too much density? In the end, planning commission uh, did not vote in favor of that because of the density issue. However, the the plant the council overturned that and they did approve it. So that was an example is when it comes back again on a final, that isn't something that the planning commission can now say, no, we don't want the density, but there aren't really any guidelines, strict guidelines on how much is too much. So if it's something that you guys don't have like design guidelines for, um, so like the facade treatment needs to be um, varied every five houses, you know, and that's what's agreed in, in the, in the PUD. And then, you know, a couple months later, the developer goes back and goes, no, that's going to cost too much. We only want to use three facade treatments for the whole development. How would that be dealt with? Well, I mean, are these standards that the planning commission has set because we don't have those design standards? Well, and, and like before Xenia had designed standards, we would set those design standards within the PUD. So that was part of that negotiation process of the PUD. You know, we it would be, okay, you know, you can't, you know, we have to have the facades were a big deal because at the time, I don't know if they still are now, you know, it's a lot easier for developers just to do a couple facades and a couple looks and then, re, you know, repeat the design. It saves a lot of money and, and materials. But then you have a neighborhood that's just two colors in two houses. And so we would go and say, you know, you need to have five or six, you know, and you can't, you can't have them any, you know, have to rotate it so that you don't have any five next to each other that, that have the same um, design. So there has to be at least five houses or six houses in between the designs. Um, with people, we came, I think Ryan, I think it was Ryan Evans came back and didn't want to do the um, multiple facade treatments, at least on the front of the house. So there had to be brick and siding, not just straight siding. Um, we had issues with um, the garage doors saying that the garage can't cover 30% of the front of the house. There had to at least be some balance to the house. So there was a lot of these design things that we had built into the PUDs. So the neighborhoods looked like, you know, neighborhoods and, and including like tree requirements that we build into these PUDs. And I know none of these things are in Yellow Springs code currently. Um, there's not the protection of having design standards there. So I would assume that they could be, and at least when I was helping um, Patty with the um, other development that was over by the Kettering Health Center on Antioch McGregor, is that Whitehall? I can't remember the name of it. Kind of behind where the new YSO building is gonna be, it's a farm land and there's a wetland area adjacent to the farm. 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 Last farm. Last, Last farm. farm, thank you. So when we were going through that and talking about what the PED requirements were gonna be, we, we added in the requirements for the rotating and the types of houses and the trees and facade um, to make sure that these details were in there as a package when it happened um, because it, there's no protection for those neighborhoods under the code right now. So is that how, you, you know, is that how Yale Springs plans to go forward? Have they done this before? How would it, and, and if it was, you know, if they are gonna put, some of these standards in there, you know, what's the process when the, if a developer comes back and says, well, now we don't want to do this and what goes back to council or what is decided by planning and zoning commission. But there are actually some design standards. Um, does, Denise can actually speak to in terms of what has to be on the contents of your preliminary plats um, under the 1226 uh, chapter 1226. 
And, um, you know, these are, you know, not just your infrastructure, but your street trees, layouts, dimensions, um, and things like that have to be on the contents of the preliminary plats. And then when you get into design standards, that's 122606, um, you know, they're looking at the other things like interior landscaping and um, the land abutting the streets. Yeah, they don't, we don't really have standards on facades. However, I mean, if if a developer came and said that we were going to do a uh, party plank and brick, I mean, we, I, that would probably, if they, if they present it as that, that, that that's what they're going to do, then that would be in that agreement that we would have the, with the, uh, for the PUD, that, that this is what they said they were going to do. The repercussions, if they end up wanting to change that, well, then that's a legal thing that we would have to go back to Brianne on that they, well, they said they were going to do this and now they're wanting to change it. So it would be part of the PUD. So whatever negotiation happens at that, that would be part of the PUD agreement. And then if they wanted to change that, they would have to go back to council and renegotiate then at that point, and then it would come back to planning and zoning commission. I don't know, Brianne. What, how would that work? Yeah, I have I have never had a developer say we're we're wanting to change the PUD agreement. But the other issue is, um, so when you actually have the PUD, it's ready to go. Um, it, it's basically effectuating a rezoning. That's a legislative act. It's subject to referendum. But if you as a planning commission or council is saying, this is what's in the PUD, we're applying the language of the PUD, and again, that's a recorded instrument, and saying this development is in compliance with what the existing PUD standard is, that's an administrative act. There's no real appeal right except to um, you know, a 2506 appeal, and under our code, People can't appeal the actions of the planning commission for certain topics, such as applying the code the way it's written. So applying the PUD, if the PUD has already been adopted as a rezoning to a specific piece of property, is just going to be treated the same way any other zoning is. is you know, you're, you're in compliance with the zoning if you do this. If you don't do this, you're not in compliance with the zoning. You can be cited for a zoning violation because you breached your PUD agreement by you know, not having the required amount of trees, not doing the landscaping, and anything else that's contained in that PUD agreement they're going to be held to. And I, I can say from a, a policy aspect of it, legislatively, when I think about projects like Cresco, um, you know, the councils I've been on have been pretty consistent about, you know, uh, holding folks to those commitments. So uh, I think this is a good discussion. I'm going to shift things because uh, we will end on time uh, at eight o'clock. Um, but I did want to say around this last topic, ideas and concerns, and um, this can be an ongoing conversation for sure. Uh, one of the things that I am realizing as we're having this discussion is that in terms of uh, council goal setting and, um, and, and also thinking about uh, strategic planning, uh, we need to be more deliberate about thinking about um, uh, the planning commission process in some of those goals, um, which many have already indicated uh, there are going to be some things where that's going to be important. Um, if you've looked at our goals before, we've you know referenced to the uh, you know particular responsible parties are. So we you know have planning commission often in a column, but I don't I don't think we've always thought about you know what the process looks like and and some of the things that we have talked about this evening. So I think that's something that's going to be really important. As a side note, we've also I think. Uh, you know, got some interest in making sure that we're really thinking about funding and financing of our projects, uh, especially because there are so many infrastructure and, and other economic development, residential related projects. So that's what I wanted to put out there. Um, I, another thing I will say is I don't know if our alternates regularly attend meetings. 
but this may be a good time for alternates to be uh, engaged with topics uh, in case they need to jump in. Um, and anyone else that has any thoughts or comments, feel free to mic on. You know, I guess I have one comment, Brian, is uh, just something I've been thinking about as we talk about uh, these new opportunities coming forward in the residential marketplace and doing projects. You know, what could we proactively do in the zoning code to try to, to, try to drive more uh, multifamily projects, whether it's an apartment building or it's fourplexes or duplexes or whatever, you know, and finding some ways that we can make those uh, more frictionless to be integrated into existing infill and other developments, um, you know, just, just the thought. Yep. Thanks for that, Matthew. Um, I, I, I think that is, is something that we definitely, uh, I hope we decide to explore. So, uh, Brian, I'll this is Lisa to your, specifically to your question about alternates. I'm the alternate to council alongside Curlis, who's the main liaison for planning commission. And I've found it absolutely imperative to either attend live or watch the replay because there's just so much going on. And I, I would also, as I mentioned earlier, think that some other members of council, depending on what's rolling into council, it's worth the time to watch the meeting to understand the context of the discussion and the depth of the discussion. I think it's really important for alternates to be active. And if, if the um, alternates um, members are available to do that or watch the replay, I think it's very important. Thanks, Lisa. Other? Comments, thoughts? Ryan? Yes, Marianne. My understanding is that one of the reasons we were having this meeting is because there were some people on planning commission, planning commission members who felt there wasn't good communication with council or something like that. And I'm and so I want to create a space for if people on the planning commission have concerns about what council is or isn't doing that that get expressed if it hasn't mm -hmm. and i think i was the last one just to say that we needed at the end of the last planning and zoning commission just about that specific code that brianna mentioned the 126204 that we needed to be able to clarify this, you know, and have a, a process because it was, I think, the second or third time since I've been on planning and zoning commission that it, I didn't know how to um, apply the code because of how you could, the definitions weren't weren't there and available. And so I just wanted to make sure that we can work through this process. I mean, it is a relatively new code. Um, you know, work through this process to make sure that we're doing what council wants us to do and we don't have um, too much left to our interpretation. Thank you. Um, and I guess I'm wondering if planning commission wants any, wants something more from council. I mean, as in more communication some way or something that, that that's a specific example, I guess, about some specific, specific, uh, texts, but are there any process things that people think should be different? So this is Steve Green. Um, <clears throat> I think what Sarah was getting at was just uh, this, you know, we have run into cases where there was a sort of a frustration, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the conditional use meets all of the requirements, but we don't we don't, we, but we kind of feel like something was a bad idea. And the, the PUD example is a good one too. Like if somebody comes into the PUD and they meet all the rules, but we think it's terrible or dreadful and don't have like a, 
you know, a rule to use to object to it with, well, we're, we're feeling sort of out in the cold. And so some of this may be just wanting to know, well, what do we do when, you know, the rule is saying that we have to say something is okay, but we feel like it's wrong. I think even further on that, you know, we have this 126204, which, especially the economic impact, where we could apply it if we know what it meant. And so at the very first year, we're like, okay, we think we know what council wanted and what was meant when the community decided to add this in, because it is a very, definitely a very Yellow Springs statement of how it, how it is written. But we can't objectively apply it to the situations unless it's operationalized in a manner that we can apply it. So saying it's going to have like the economic impact is great because Brianna and I were like, well, what does that mean? Do we have a real estate person come in and show that there's going to be a change in value based upon something that's going to happen? Or would it be a public asset? Like, what does that mean necessarily? Because as it states right now, then it's just our opinion. And you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm weird. I like things to be black and white. I don't like, you know, the law should just be, you know, this is how it is. And we have this measure for economic impact. There should be a way to say, okay, this is how we assess if there's an economic impact. So if there is a citizen that feels like they're going to have a negative economic impact, they have a mechanism to go get someone to assess the property, assess the property with the change and come to us and say, look, here's the facts and information as you know, you said is allotted in the code what you know how can we apply it now because there there's just been a couple of these where we, we need we need some firming up of, of how we should apply it sarah can I make this a comment? Is, <clears throat> oh, go ahead laura i you know there are things in the law that are that, that are purposely not objective I, I think this is one it's purposely subjective and it's meant to give, I think, Planning Commission the space to, as Stephen says, like if you think there are these social or other economic implications of this that you think are negative to the general welfare of the community, you can you can make a decision on that 126204 basis. I well, because no. you remember the discussion about proximity with the. Um, yeah. It's housing. Sorry, my allergies are awful right now. I'm having problems finding the words. Um, you know, and, and so that was an operationalized. So then we could say, all right, well, proximity is going to be a mile for this person and proximity is 300 feet for this person. And some, I, I get where social impact, you know, we might narrow it down a little bit, but there's no way we can say what the social impact, you know, can be. But when you have terms like economic impact, well, let's, let's, Let's say what that means and how someone in how to empower one of our citizens to say, you know, this is what we want. And they have a way to show that this is what's happening, um, because that is more of an, you know, firm kind of quantity that they could come up with rather than them coming to us and saying, well, it's making an economic impact and we have to make some subjective estimate when they could actually go and find out if it actually does make an economic impact and we've allowed them to do so. Yeah. And with the feet, you know, yeah. okay. <laughs> Can somebody. I make a comment? Um, so I agree with what, what Laura said. And I also think you, you, part of what your frustration is, is that um, you want something to be very specific, but that's why the checks and balances are built in. So if the PUD comes to you and you're like, oh my God, this is egregious, but it meets all of the standards, we have to vote yes, that it meets all of the standards. It goes on to council and council can say, oh my God, this is egregious. We don't care if it meets all the standards. We have a comprehensive plan. We have a vision. We have village values that allow us to vote against this because mm -hmm. for a political body, we are not quasi-judicial. And that's that's where the checks and balances come in that I think offset the frustration in a way you are locked into a role in a little bit of a way um, and then counsels the body that can, can make a correction or that can say, as they did, we have an issue with um, transient guest lodging, so we'd like to make this legislative change and then that's gonna limit how much of this you're able to do. Okay, so it took a minute for things to go into effect, but it corrected 
the course. Um, and people may have had a, a you know two months of frustration, but uh, but the course was corrected. So I don't I don't see it as hugely problematic. I think it gives you beneficial leeway in hearing different kinds of cases where if it was very locked in, you might not have that leeway and not be able to permit something you felt was an excellent, new, ingenious kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. To, to Judy's point, there are always going to be objective factors in your code and subjective factors in your code. But my point from a legal perspective is when a planning commission or council makes its decision we have to spell out what those factors are, regardless of whether they're subjective or objective, because if planning commission or council imposes restrictions or conditions which are not in the code at all, the Supreme Court of Ohio will tell you that is ad hoc spot zoning and it is illegal. Um, there was a case out of uh, Village Granville in 2019, I think it involved Southgate Corporation and the holding was, the imposition of non-existent restrictions or conditions are by definition arbitrary as there are no guidelines or factors for consideration set out in the code, therefore no way for a property owner to anticipate what's a permitted use or what limitations on a use may be. So that's where we have to have something to point to, whether, okay. again, so whether it's objective, whether it's subjective. I mean, I'm a lawyer, so I also prefer objective. But the point is, when you're making those decisions, to make a record on the basis of those factors so, so that Brianne, are in the code. Brianne, going back to this whole thing about like the economic impact of uh, you know a conditional use. So if we start looking, you know, in this case we were talking about before, it was having something overlooking their backyard. When we go into something like if we're going to have you know duplexes and multiplexes you know in neighborhoods well you know if it's going to affect what the the property values of the neighbors to those things you know i, I think we're sort of looking for you know it's it's in the code that the, we're able, able to consider the economic impact on the neighbors but you know if we say it has to be uh it has to be you know the, some kind of objective realtor based thing um that's going to, you know, I guess we're looking for a way to like, how do you actually do that? How, yeah. could how do you somebody prove it? Yeah. How, yeah. How, how, yeah. Not, not just how do you quantify it, but how do you prove it? I mean, yeah. there's, and, there's, and so, uh, you know, there's persuasive evidence and, you know, there's some hearings that you as a planning commission are going to have, you know, the property owner and one neighbor, it's going to be, he said, she, she said, and you're going to say, well, who's more credible? And I mean, courts are tasked with doing that in a lot of circumstances. So what is, you know, your burden of proof? Well, it's a civil administrative hearing when you're looking at, you know, well, what, what factors are we applying here? You are, you are sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity applying factors, and those factors are where you go, okay, that's where our burden of proof is, um, you know, is there an economic impact? Well, the property owner just saying, this is going to ruin my property value versus yeah. they bring you a realtor's report or an appraiser's report or some other form of evidence that's satisfactory. But again, it's up to you to establish what the burden proof is. Okay. Well, and again, be very careful what you ask for because you may want that precise uh, wording in the, in the zoning code and then it becomes a not in my backyard. We all mm -hmm. want multiple family housing. We just yeah. want multiple family housing, but uh, not next to me because my view, my 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 backyard, my stuff, and that's exactly where those things have to be extremely carefully balanced. And you risk tipping too far one way if you make that language super specific. I talked to Dave and Denise today before this meeting. So, um, like, <laughs> I guess my concern is I want to make sure it it's a you know these things that are so are general are applied in a way that's fair and consistent to the public. And there isn't any mechanism here where there's a historical perspective of this is how we've done it and this is here and this is here, which might be a helpful way if we don't want to be very specific about what we're doing you know, my ethical concern is that the code is applied in a fair, unbiased way to everyone in every situation. And that, you, you know, that we have the history to say, this is how it's done before. 
And now, it, you know, we are going to do it the exact same way because that's what we've done in the past. Um, so it's not spot zoning and we don't get ourselves in trouble if we don't have some, you know, objective measure available or, or more objective definition that's handed down from council that is now in the code based upon the community ethics. And I think those are some great notes to end on. It is eight o'clock and as promised, we're gonna end on time, just like I like to start on time. Uh, so great discussion. I have a lot of thoughts in my mind. Um, we should definitely continue to think more about how we achieve those same goals. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Thanks, aye. everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye.